Now we're going to look at verse 19, verse 19. So there was this division problem with Jew and Gentile. There was always this division problem. Now let's look at verse 19. Now therefore, so therefore, now what happens to us? Ye are no more strangers and foreigners. So you Gentiles, Amen. again, Gentiles mean non-Jews, you're no more strangers or even foreigners, but fellow citizens. Praise the Lord. We're fellow citizens. Now look at over here with who? With the saints and of the household of God. Okay, so now we're fellow citizens with God's saints, with God's household. Now this becomes a problem with the mid acts people. Okay, so remember, the Gentiles is what Paul is, whom Paul is speaking to, right? You guys are the ones, strangers and foreigners. But they joined a group of people. Wait a minute, they joined who? The ones who are considered saints or fellow citizens with the household of God. What's the context here? Why the context, look at verse 12, that's referring to Israel. Jews. Wait a minute. Now the mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists have a problem. They insist that the body of Christ started with the Apostle Paul. And then everything before the Apostle Paul was Jew, 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 Jew. So then if there was a church or if there was a body before the Apostle Paul, it was a separate, it was another body, a second body. And that's a Jewish body. That's not the same body of Christ that the Apostle Paul was referring to. Wait a minute. Look at this. The body of Christ Paul is talking about is what? Them joining who? Jews. Oh, there, that means there was a body of Christ that consisted of Jews, which we agree with the hyper-dispensationalists, but that was before Paul even mentioned about the Gentiles and the Gentiles later joined. Wow. See, you can't be a mid acts hyper-dispensationalist. Some of them, they teach as, uh, some of them online, they attack our ministry. And then uh, there's this one person that, uh, that they idolize and who's probably the most popular for their YouTube channel. But he got upset that he threw in a comment around our channel, on our video, treating us Bible-believing preachers as if we're not, we're not real dispensationalists like them. We don't know as much dispensationalism like they do. Why? Because we divide so many things. So we know more than you. No, that just shows how amateur you are, that you have to divide everything, yeah. that you can't, that you're incapable of even harmonizing. Mm. That's the thing. So notice over here that it shows that, the, that these group of people joined the Jewish body. Whoa. What are you going to do about that? Otherwise, how are you going to argue fellow citizens with the saints? Who are they? And of the household of God. Who are you going to argue right there? Who is that that they join together with? Who is that group of people? It's referring to Jewish believers who got saved before those Gentiles. Because remember what Jesus preached at Acts chapter 1? You're going to preach at Jerusalem, Judea, see Jews... And then what? To the uttermost parts of the earth, the ones who are far off, the Gentiles. How about that? Why? Because the Gentiles are joining them. All right, now let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Now, we're going to, uh, actually, this entire lesson is going to be uh, critiquing the hyper-dispensational movement for some weird reason, because so many verses here address them. Now, let's look at verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So notice over here that this body of Christ, right? The Gentiles that Paul was preaching about, it's built upon the foundation of, it's not giving these mid-acts a break. These people are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets before them, before Paul. Wow, this is, this is brutal. And they love the book of Ephesians. They love Ephesians, the mid-Acts people. But they, that book is probably the, 
uh, the most detrimental book against the Mid-Acts movement, if not one of the most. So apostles and prophets, that means that they were in the body of Christ before Paul. It did not start with Paul. It did not go Mid-Acts. All right, so let's look at the point over here. Let's keep reading. If you're still stuck at the Mid-Acts movement after these teachings, then, you're, then what makes you different from different cults who ignore the plain truth of Scripture, mm -hmm. especially scriptural evidence, right. especially Mid-Acts that they boast so much, they boast that they know so much Scripture, that they're very knowledgeable. All right, let's look at verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So, they're the, so notice that these people are a foundation that later Gentiles were able to build upon that Paul was able to preach and minister. Keep reading. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So notice that Jesus Christ himself, that he is over here the chief cornerstone. So he is the foundation there. If you study about construction and buildings, then you'll notice over here that when they lay a foundation, here's what they, that is very salient and important, this chief cornerstone. Why? Because the rest can be built upon this. Now, establishing that Jesus Christ, he is the chief cornerstone and the foundation, uh, there are a few things to notice over here. First of all, the Catholic apolog apologists uh, they claim that the popes are the foundation of the church, that the church is founded upon the popes. But we deny that. We say, no, we can't trust in man as a foundation. Jesus Christ is our foundation. So some Catholic apologists will use this verse. Well, no, look at verse 20. See, notice that man is involved in the foundation, apostles and prophets. So how are you going to argue against that? Actually, it's more simple than you think. The simple answer to that is go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. You know what the simple answer to that is? Is that notice that the Jesus Christ we believe is this. When we say Jesus Christ is a foundation, we're saying that he's a final authority, all right? But there are people who can build upon this foundation. So apostles and prophets, yes, we can call them the foundation, but see, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ, he's the chief, so he has to be on top still, the final authority. Well, then some might argue, well, then why can't we just say the popes then build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ? Very simple. It says apostles and prophets, not popes. It's that simple. They might say, well, no, uh, well the popes, they, they're considered to be the apostle and the vicar of Christ. No, to qualify as an apostle is those who, actually, when Jesus Christ started his ministry, see the foundation, who had to continue that? Who had to carry his teaching? The apostles. Not hundreds of years later with Constantine and then the later popes, and then they abused their power and they told the people through the dark ages, you listen to me. And then they abused the money, they abused sex, they abused power, and they tortured people. So no, that's a, that is not how Jesus Christ runs his church. How Jesus Christ runs his church is, hey, I start the ministry and guess what? You apostles and prophets are going to carry it on and we end it right there. The Christians are then, they themselves are going to start their independent local churches and go by the word of God. Because to qualify as an apostle, it definitely be, uh, it only sticks to first century. You can't go beyond. Because look at Acts chapter 1, to qualify as an apostle. We'll look at verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all... Okay, how do you qualify? Companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. See? Because they were witnesses of Jesus Christ. So that's why they had to carry his teaching. Not some pope hundreds of years later. I can claim that. I, I can claim that. Hey, Jesus told me so and so. You're going to listen to me? No, then I'll be a cult leader. Keep reading verse 22. Beginning from where? The baptism 
come of John until the same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? Mm -hmm. So they have to be a witness who saw Jesus Christ resurrected, one. <clears throat> Number two, they had to be at the timeline at the beginning of John the Baptist. And, um, and then verse 21, they had to be accompanied with the Lord Jesus Christ when he went in and, amount, uh, went in and out. Verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and what? Apostleship. That's how you qualify to be an apostle. So popes don't qualify. Okay, go to Ephesians 2 again. Ephesians chapter 2. So when a Catholic apologist pulls up this verse on you, make sure that you uh, point out to them, well, it's simple. Pope is not an apostle. Well, he's an apostle of Christ. No, to qualify as an apostle is based off of Acts chapter 1. Now let's look at uh, verse 21. So if Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets lay the foundation, then the context here is a building project. It can keep building upwards. Verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together. Ah, so then this becomes a building. This building then becomes fitly, it becomes very fitting, framed together. It just frames nicely together. Then, Man, that's a, that's a huge blessing. So the huge blessing is that you are partakers in this. Now you see this church over here? This church that is built over here can come out nicely. Let's keep reading. Together, see that? Together, why? Jews and Gentiles. Well, so the church, it consists of Jews and Gentiles. Don't just say it's a separate body of believers, separate Jews. No, this is together because it's building on the Jews before mid-Acts. <laughs> Keep reading. Together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. It grows. So it, it, it's keep on going up. So guess what? The body of Christ is still growing upwards. And it becomes a holy temple for God. Man, that's considered holy. Us? If you go to churches, you can see one of the worst people that ever lived is in Bible-believing Christian churches like ours. Wow, how, dare, how can you say that? Because it's the truth. Sometimes if you look at your own life and then you look at church splits, church fights, and the deacons turning against pastors, pastors turning against pastors, and then there are scandals that happen. Why? Because we're sinners, let's be honest. We're sinners. We're not holy rulers, holy men of God. So looking at that, it's amazing that the Lord will consider all of us as a holy temple in the Lord despite of our bickering, our fighting, our own sinful problems, and we can't function well as a church. Isn't that amazing? What a God. We also are builded together. So all of us are builded together for what? An habitation of God. So it becomes God's habitation, His house. Through the Spirit. That's the key. It's all done through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Man, what a blessing, man. Amen. What a blessing that the Lord can do that for you and I. You. What a great God. Now, all of us become a holy temple in the Lord. Look at, uh, let me show you how unfathomable this is. Go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. So, when we gather together as a church, or when you're at the privacy of your own room, we're all still the body of Christ. Being His body, that means if we're His body, that's His home. We're His home. And God considers that as holy. Man, amazing how many times you let God down. Especially when you sin and mess up, that God would consider you as a holy home for Him to live in all the way till the day you die. What a great God. That's all I can say. You know why you should live holy for Him? That's why you should live so holy for Him. You know why? Because He's going to give you a holy home. Your, didn't you know you're God's holy temple? Guess what? God's, you got to live the best way you can to make Him live well with you because for eternity, He's going to make you live well with Him and He be your temple. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Notice what the Bible says about God becoming our temple at verse 22. 
and I saw no temple therein. Why? For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Wow, in the new Jerusalem, in new heaven for all eternity, God becomes our new temple, holy home, where we can live happily ever after, where we never experience pain, sorrow, grief. And yet we, as God's temple and home, where he can live in, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We let him down. Am I preaching a sermon right here? Amen. You thought that the hard part was that, oh, you kick those hypers, pastor, hyper dispensationalists. No, the hardest preaching has to be us. You got, so does that motivate you a bit more now to serve God more faithfully, to get more involved in church, to read your Bible and pray and to quit your worldliness and your sin? Amen. You better live your best for him. You know why? Because he's going to give you one that you, is zero pain and problem. Can't you make it the best for God to where it's like less grievous, less painless, uh, less painful? Excuse me. All right, go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. All right, so all of this is done through the power of the Holy Spirit because he combined Jew and Gentile together. So this division is gone. With this division gone, the Holy Spirit... He puts it where we have access to the Father and we grow into this holy temple in the Lord. And no mid-axe person can rob you of that promise on that one. 